interesting and, and un undercovered aspects there. Um, Andreas, um, I know that you look at Qatar a lot, and uh, this strategic Hamas uh, Qatar relationship, uh, I presume, is, could well be coming under a lot of pressure. I was wondering if you have any insights on where we're going there. Does it have any, uh, any kickback, any blowback for Qatar's relationship um, with, it, it, with the West, um, which is, of course, as a major uh, gas producers of interest to our audience? Yeah, I think what we have to differentiate here is between the circus that we see on online and social media and in, in media, uh, and also what politicians say to the media and what is actually being said behind closed doors. Um, this is an immensely intense war over narratives um, where, you know, most of what comes to the public eye is somewhat distorted. Um, behind closed doors, obviously, the American government knows, that, understands the relationship. They know that Hania went to Qatar in 2012 at the request of uh, the Obama administration. It was a, a, a way in an attempt to potentially moderate uh, Hamas and also, for, most importantly, make sure that Khaled Mashal, who was already in Qatar at the time, would not leave with Hania to a place like Iran or Syria where he was out of bounds and out of reach. Um, and I think this, this is still a very, very great concern. Um, and I, I particularly think so if you think about um, the requests that were made by the Israelis and, and then being pressed upon, um, upon uh, certain congressmen who've sent a letter to the Qatari embassy in Washington of, um, arguing for or, or putting pressure to release and extradite Hania to somewhere. Um, I think this is a very short-sighted view, again, fueled by that war over narratives, where, because the question is, where is he going to go, right? If, he, if he's going to Iran, there's certainly not in our Western interest. If he's going to Lebanon, which might be the other country, or Syria, that would take him certainly also not in our interest. Um, secondly, I think we also need to understand Hamas as a very complex network. I think the narrative that the Israelis have tried to project has been to say Hamas is ISIS, it's a unitary actor, uh, when in reality, Hamas is a networked actor, right? It's, it's a fairly complex entity uh, where some, many times the left hand doesn't know what the right hand does. When we come to the hostages, for example, um, it's quite clear that even the brigades that affiliate with Hamas are, have no clue where all the hostages are because there were a lot of, you know, a lot of activism, a lot of agency on the ground where, where people were just seizing the opportunity and taking people. That also goes to show that particularly the political leadership and Haniyeh and Mashal, who is in Turkey, had very little insight or uh, in any way control over what was happening on the ground. And I think that's a very important point yeah, to make. Uh, are you confident on this? I'm very because confident it's quite on that. And I give, I'll tell you why. Um, because, A, it is a very networked actor. If you have a political leadership that would have been involved in something as, you know, as, as something that required that much planning. This is, was not something they came up with over, the, over a few days before the operation. That's been planned for months, potentially years. Um, and certainly, at some point, people would have heard that some, they might plan in the future something like that. But the very immaculate and very detailed planning of this was certainly not shared with anyone else. Otherwise, it would have been picked up. If Hania in Qatar, who's under immense intelligence scrutiny, yeah. all the communications are under intense intelligence scrutiny, had received any sort of red, green light, red light, or any sort of warning, it would have been picked up and it would have been shared. Um, it was, you know, we, we know that those people were part of that operation, had stayed for the last two weeks before the operation in a, in a safe house where they didn't have any con access to the internet or to mobile phones because it was so, uh, uh, you know, so problematic. So definitely he was not involved in that. Also, well, you could also make a great case, and that's what a lot of people in Gaza are saying as well, Hania is completely out of touch with what's actually going on on the ground. And that kind of um, you know, begs the question to what extent he actually has leverage over what these brigades are doing and to what extent he has leverage over the hostage situation as well. Uh, and I think he made this, there was a statement released a couple of days ago where he said exactly that. He says, you know, uh, we don't actually know how many people have been taken and where they are because we don't have full control over it. Now, to come back to Qatar, yeah. the Qataris have taken, but it's an important point. So by hosting the political leadership, you're not hosting Hamas. The funding that has gone to Hamas has not gone to Hamas from Qatar, it's gone from Qatar to Israelis' bank accounts, co-signed co by bankers in Israel and the United States in full transparency, and from then has gone into, uh, into Gaza. I think the, the notion that's been projected here by you know, weaponized narratives is 
Qatar is put, you know, using bags of cash and dumping it somewhere in, uh, inside Gaza, which is no longer, the, this is not the case. This is not something uh, since 2012, this is with Israel. Um, they're always saying we're only speaking by intermediaries and by the United States. In reality, there is a direct relationship between uh, uh, um, um, the, the Qatari envoy and the Israelis, and they're speaking to one another. Um, so that goes to the point of how much do they actually control. Now, why do we need Qatar? Everything that Alistair was just saying, we're, we have to see that context in the, in the, in a much, from a much broader picture rather than the local conflict in Gaza. Yeah. We're on the knife's edge. We're very close to this potentially flaring up on this, with a second front in northern Israel, uh, potentially also in the Golan, potentially in the West Bank, uh, potentially with other Iran-aligned actors uh, interfering in this conflict. And in this context, you require an intermediary power, someone who can speak to everyone, especially speaking to Iran. And it's the worst time to now go out and pointing the finger and saying, oh, we don't like that the countries have a relationship with Iran, that the countries have a relationship with, with Hamas. I think it's in this point that the British government, and the British government made it very clear that they're working very closely with Qatar on this. The US government said they're working very closely with Qatar on this. In this point in time, you require someone who has access to these actors. It's an asset rather than a threat. Thank you, thank you. Let's take up that point of escalation. That's what we're going to be in 10 years' time. Where will yeah, we be next week? Yeah, no, I, look, I, I disagree that uh, there is no binary view on this. It's not either the East or the West. We're living in a multipolar world, and I think we also shouldn't take agency away from the Arab world. Uh, I do think that all actors, including the Russians and the Chinese, accept that the Arab world has, especially the Gulf states now, have an extensive leverage over what's going on in the region, independently of US pressure. We've definitely seen that. Saudi, UAE, Qatar in particular are independently acting to an extent, independently acting uh, actors that choose based on their values, principles, and also interests. And it's important that they also act on principle, where their principles do not align with US interests, and this is what we're seeing, seeing right now. China will find it very difficult, and Russia will also find it very difficult to kind of build a consensus on this issue. Uh, even if, I think what they're trying to do now, it's not really about Palestine. I think what they're doing is they're trying to exploit the weakness of the West and the inconsistency with which the West is applying values and principles on, on, uh, towards Palestine, and on the other hand, uh, applying them to Ukraine. That inconsistency is going to haunt us for a, quite a very long time. I think, you know, if, if I would compare it the damage that was done in 2003, we've, after 20 years, after the war in Iraq, we tried to rebuild the posture, credibility, legitimacy of the West. The damage that has been done in the last 10 days to this rebuilding, I think we're, going back, we're now back at where we were in 2003. 20 years of rebuilding legitimacy, credibility has been destroyed uh, in the Arab world in particular, but also in the global south more, more, more widely within, within just 10 days. And I think that is, that is extremely problematic. Where do we go from here is obviously the, the key question. I, I agree with Alistair. I think the, the ground invasion is going to be not just messy, it's going to be impossible, impossible. I've been someone, I've been working and with- And it's it. definitely gonna happen. I can't see how not. If you look at the stated objectives by the Israelis, um, the crushing and extermination of Hamas requires a ground component, and even then they would not be able to achieve it. But it, it's quite clear that I was thinking when, with Biden coming, he might be able to moderate, but after seven hours, after hours and hours of talking to the Israelis, they came out and said, it, the US is backing this. And as Alistair rightly said, the US is complicit in whatever is going to happen next, and they are willing to take the risk. The problem with that is that this, the IDF, the, the Israeli military, is not supposed to be involved in political strategy. They're supposed to be a tool for political strategy. What has happened here is that the IDF is placed in a context, an impossible one, by a political leadership that is, is, is ideological, a uh, political leadership like Netanyahu, who is not, has never, has never been statesmanlike, has never been really looking into, into the future, has never been able to actually achieve anything in any respect that was strategic. And using the IDF as a military to achieve a political end, that doesn't work. The military is merely a tool. Hamas will not be destroyed militarily. It's impossible for all the reasons Alistair already outlined. 70 meter deep tunnels, concrete reinforced. There is not a single JDM, not a single bunker buster bomb that will blow this up. Um, and in the, in, the, in, in the course of that, civilians are still there. Where are they going to go, right? So we will have more civilian casualties. And as he also rightly said, Hamas is just waiting for an excuse. Their credibility is also 
uh, really hanging on a thread now if they don't react to that, to the atrocities that will be committed. The fact that the US is now moving another warship into the Eastern Mediterranean this morning suggests, and also we have 2,000 Marines being sent there this week, it really suggests that the Americans are putting up a deterrence regime against Iran getting involved, but knowing that Hezbollah has a degree of agency to do, to do what they want to do. And the messaging from Iran has been quite clear. While they don't want to get dragged in directly, the, what they call the axis of, of um, resistance will get involved, and Hezbollah will have to get involved. And that is going to be messy. I think Israel is driven by pain, is driven by revenge, um, but so blindly that they require someone from outside to tell them where to stop. Unfortunately, I thought the Biden administration could have done this, but they didn't. So the ground invasion is the logical next step. And from there, we're in unknown territory. A two-front war such as this is going to be far worse than what we've seen in 2006. The international environment is a different one than it was in 2006. Uh, Hezbollah is far better enough. Last time I was in Lebanon, in southern Lebanon, looking at the arsenal, the technology, the training that's been going on. Hezbollah has been the most probably, has probably more operation experience than any Iranian entity. They have been involved in Yemen training the Houthis. They have been involved in, in, in the war in Iraq training uh, Hajj al-Shabi there. They have been involved in, in any way Iran has been involved. Hezbollah has been there as their kind of the pioneering front uh, knives edge part of their force. So they're well trained, they're well equipped, they're also great in numbers. And there's a whole spectrum of things that Hezbollah can do to Israel in the north. And I think what it will do, it will erode Israel, but obviously Netanyahu also knows that's an important point. Not only is he an ideologue and is void of any strategic mindset, but he's also someone who, uh, is, um, who knows that his time in politics is going to be over. The failure of what happened on the 7th of October will be on him and his government. So he will try to write this out. His entire legacy depends on how he reacts to this. So backing down now is not something he can do vis-a-vis in, in, you know, -vis the, the Israeli public. And my fear is from Hezbollah and the US getting dragged into this, into a conflict with Hezbollah, it's an extremely uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, problematic situation because in the end of the day, the US is getting dragged into a war indirectly with Iran. And that could have all kinds of implications for activities in the Gulf. We've seen mobilization in Yemen where the Houthis have you know, all and energy security. Energy security, right? The Houthis have missiles, they have, you know, we know the capabilities they have, and they might not just target the UAE and Saudi Arabia, they might target ship shipping lanes, they might target tankers going through the Bab al Mandab. There, there, there are implications in, in, in everything that's happening, and I think that's why it is so short sighted for the US government to unequivocally support this, this, this Israeli campaign that has absolutely no strategic end game. Yeah. Uh, Alistair. Just a short yeah. comment. This is a turning point in Middle Eastern history that is you know, one of these major inflection points that, that we shouldn't underestimate because it could go as far, I think the credibility of Israel, and that's one of the reasons that has led normalization, one of the reasons, is the realization since uh, 1973 that Israel cannot be defeated on the battlefield. That credibility of its deterrence is collapsing. The fact, the, the weakness that Israel has shown over the last 10 days might invite all kinds of people to exploit the situation. And I would say one more thing about weaponized narratives, and I think that affects us here in the UK, it affects us globally, is that conflict is not a regional conflict, it's a global conflict, everyone is involved. The polarization is translating into activism here in London with you know, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia on the other side, all yeah. coming together, mobilizing people to do things, lone wolf attacks, um, what we've seen in Tunisia uh, uh, last night, uh, attacks against Jewish communities here and, 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 and elsewhere. It's very, very important that governments stay neutral on this. The UK government should not state that it has a vested interest in this conflict. We don't. We, what we, are, we should stand on matter of principle, not on matter of uh, you know, uh, saying mantra-like, we're standing with Israel unequiv uh, unequivocally. It's very important that we have a balanced approach to this, because whatever we communicate, whatever government communicates, has direct ramifications for what's going on, on the ground in our cities. Yeah, uh, this is very much a, a war of, um, of communication. Well, uh, I think there is, my, my company, we do, we do geopolitical forecasting and wargaming, and there's been all kinds of, every, in every iteration, every round of the game, there are intervening variables that will, can lead us into different trajectories, and there are a lot of intervening variables, and I think diplomacy is one of them. Uh, and, you know, we can't just say there's just one single trajectory towards escalation. 
the, the first escalatory step that I think is highly likely is the ground invasion, after which we're in another round of a game where then, then every, every actor will have to see for themselves, what are we going to do next? What is Hezbollah going to do? How is Israel going to respond to this? How is the US going to respond to this? And diplomacy is going on in the background the entire time, and it will continue. Um, Iran and Saudi have no, no, none of the Gulf states or Iran have an interest in any escalation. And they will make sure it, 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 the, the impact on uh, trade routes, supply chains, <coughs> will be limited because that's a vested interest for everyone, right? They want to contain it. At the same time, they have a, a face to lose. And I think both Iran and the Saudis have to compete, and they are competing, over who is the protector of Al-Aqsa Mosque, who's the protector of the Palestinian cause. There is competition between the two to make sure they'll be coming out as, as the peacemakers in this. The funny story of this is that the Saudis and the Iranians appear to be more interested in peace and stability than the Americans are. And that in itself is a major paradigm shift. Um, but I do think that in every round of the game there is a route for de-escalation because it, 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 requires, it requires, unfortunately, massacre after massacre for the Israelis to wake up and realize that they can't continue the way they can that they are doing at the moment and I do think that with Israel Israel could be driven into a state of Pyrrhic victory like in 1973 where they can't win on the battlefield but they realize that then they have to re resort to negotiation and then we have a, a chance by Saudi and the Arab world to stand together and propose a, uh, a, a political solution to the problem rather than a military one. There is an opportunity for that. So out of the ashes of this war, you could actually rebuild uh, a Palestinian statehood, as, as harsh as it sounds. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat>